I'm Terrence McNally here at uh, Bioneers 2011, and with me right now is Michael Marks. Hi, Michael. Hi. Michael is the director of the Beyond Oil campaign for the Sierra Club and the founder of Corporate Ethics International and the Business Ethics Network. He taught organizational behavior at the University of Wisconsin-Madison's Business School, was a management consultant to Fortune 500 companies before turning to activism. He designed and directed the international boycott Mitsubishi campaign for the Rainforest Action Network for four years. He was executive director of the Coastal Rainforest Coalition, which transformed into forest ethics, of which he was the executive director until 2003 when he founded Corporate Ethics International. And Michael currently directs the International Tar Sands Oil Campaign, which involves over 50 groups working in the US, Europe, and Canada. Okay, you started out teaching in a business school mm -hmm. and consulting to corporate clients. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about your path from there to what you're doing today. Well, I think I was always in my heart an environmentalist. Uh, but I think I was also enough of a pragmatist to go, well, let's go get a graduate degree, let's, let's teach, let's start a consulting business, all of which happened. and. Uh, you know, and, and I'm working with major corporations. I'm de designing selection assessment systems for them for, for screening uh, managers for senior level positions, for example, and hiring in new managers and new salespeople. And there was just a point at which I went, what am I doing? You know, but making money. It and and let, me, let me ask, I'm assuming that what you were doing, in a sense, was you had this part of your life compartmentalized, I and did. then you were an environmentalist uh, I, I, signing I was, the petitions? I was, and, I was signing petitions. Yeah, yeah. I was sending checks to all of these different environmental groups. And I actually had uh, one of those events in your life, which Good. sometimes turns you around, where I thought I had terminal cancer. In fact, I was diagnosed as, uh, and, and I went, and I just, at the time, I just went, look, I don't know if there's anybody up there, but if, if you get me out of this, uh, I will follow my heart. I'll do what I think I came here to do, and that's I'll become an environmentalist, and I'll leave my business behind. Because I think, you know, in the face of, of yeah. death, you, you, you get a really good sense of no, what it's, matters. No, it's interesting. It's a really good argument for false alarms. <laughs> yes, and it was a false alarm. I mean, if everyone had a false alarm, we'd probably be a little further along. I think it was one of the best, <laughs> best served uh, false alarms ever, in my case. Um, and then you can even take it a little further forward. In other words, I, I really appreciate uh, those kind of turning points, uh, but sort of how you've gone from a specific campaign to actually, it sounds to me now, even though the specific work you're doing in Beyond Oil, a lot of your thrust is about the whole corporate system. It is. In fact, when I founded Corporate Ethics and I left Forest Ethics, it was because I felt that we were as NGOs, non-governmental organizations and advocacy groups going around and putting out thousands of fires all over. We're just running like crazy. Always on, on the defensive. Always <laughs> on the defensive. And I went, there is a deeper problem. And the problem is that corporations have too much power in our society. They have corrupted our democracy. They run our government. And, and their freedom of speech is being abused. And, and if we don't go to that deeper problem, we will be putting out these fires and be on defense for the rest of our lives and for our children's lives. You know, as I always would, I mean, I've been myself as well as a journalist and activist and so on, and I always say, you know, the juggernaut never sleeps. No. You know, no. we get burned out after a campaign. They've got reinforcements, and it just doesn't stop. No, greed is powerful, and there's a certain, and, and you know, I'm reminded that we are animals. And, and animals are about dominance, you know, that one of the cr critical traits of animals in survival is dominance. Well, it carries into the human species as well. And in my old job as a person who profiled senior level managers, what's the best predictor of who rises to the top of an organization? It's dominance. Alpha. It's yeah, exactly right. Extremely competitive, extremely controlling, uh, very domineering. And um, so really, they just keep coming back. Yeah. Uh, and they probably always will until we we set up structures that, from a very early time, rechannel that dominance into the protection uh, and and more of a communal orientation and the uplifting right. of others. Yeah, yeah. In other words, it, it as I often find myself looking at, it's how big is your circle of concern? Yeah. And if your circle of concern extends to your department and you're an alpha, you will do everything for that department. If it extends to that company, you'll do everything for that company. 
what if it extended to the community? Right. What if it extended, you know? Right. Then you'd put all that alphaness in the service of everyone. You know, I think sometimes we think, uh, I want to get rich so that I can give my kids the best education and the, and the best future. And I go, well, what if you made the community in which your children grow up rich? Rich in a true social wealth kind of way. Perhaps your, the kids that you raise and who are also influenced by their peers and by other parents would be even better kids, more, more remarkable human beings, and maybe realize that it's not, the, it's not that kind of financial wealth that gives yeah. them a sense of fulfillment. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about Rainforest Action Network. Um, one of the things I found interesting about them over the years is that, uh, and this was certainly true in the time when Randy Hayes was there, and I still think continues, which is that in several instances, they fought a corporation over certain practices. And you know, they were, they were right there like that until the campaign won. And then they shifted into being their partner in how to implement and how to monitor and how mm -hmm. to manage. Uh, talk a little bit about that, because I think that's a really interesting model. I think it is. Uh, you know, we have this, this principle, soft on the people, hard on the issue. So that when, when we were engaged in a campaign, even if we were engaged in civil disobedience, we were hanging off their building or off the cranes of Home Depot as they were building their new stores, the principle was always, but you treat the people who are the managers with great respect. And because you're preserving the relationship because at one point they're gonna realize their brand uh, is uh, at risk it's, and it's easier and maybe even wiser for them to r solve this problem a lot because uh, and many of them have said later, when we interviewed them, went back and interviewed yeah. them, and I went back and interviewed people at Nike and Home Depot and Mitsubishi and uh, Lowe's, all of them, the companies we had gone after, and they all said we're better companies because of those wow. campaigns. And, it, and they were better in part because their culture changed and, the, and we were part of going in afterwards and making sure they lived up to their promises, but also it's interesting when you're the outsiders and you're coming in, but you've been in battle and now you're, you're partners. They treat you with a certain respect. Well, that's what I was thinking, is that because Rand was always a, a worthy opponent. It's a worthy opponent. Then they become a respected partner. Yes. I remember one time after the Mitsubishi campaign, we had, and we had targeted Mitsubishi Motors pretty heavily. And uh, Dick Rakia, who was the uh, vice president of operations during that whole battle, ended up coming around to our side during the middle of the fight because Motors wasn't the problem, the corporation was the problem. They're the ones that were logging rainforest. But I remember at the end when we had reached a resolution, I went down, I saw how proud he was to introduce me to his employees and talk about the solution that we had reached. And I realized that he considered us a worthy opponent and that we had engaged in battle honorably in the marketplace and that now we were on the same side, and I think it really felt empowering to him. That's, that's a very powerful message. Um, what are the missions and the goals of Corporate Ethics International and the Business Ethics Network? The mission and goal of, of Corporate Ethics International and Ben, the Business Ethics Network, is really to bring corporations back in service to and under the control of the citizenry. Before you go further, um, for people who don't know it, a bit of a history lesson. And, and I'll just start the ball and you take over. But, but corporations, if people can remember kind of the uh, Hudson Bay and mm -hmm. East India and so on, came into being for a specific public good, at the, served at the, um, the, the, the pleasure of the sovereign, yes. which of course was a king or a queen, but here, that's us. Yes. And what happened? Well, what happened is companies like Hudson Bay and the East India Company almost became countries in themselves. They became extremely powerful. They became the ones who appointed the governors, for example, in the case of East India. Of the colonies. Of the colonies uh, in India, for example, Hudson Bay in, in Canada. And they became so powerful over time that um, they began to acquire a great deal of wealth and be able to influence the system so we no longer took away their charters. And they began to say, well, we're acquiring property are you going to dissolve our charter and make us get rid of all of that property? You might need us again. And that was when it all started to crack because in the process of giving them the rights to hold on to that property, 
then we created an entity that could last in perpetuity. That could last in perpetuity, that was shielded from liability. Shielded, shielded from and, liability. And as you pointed out, which I hadn't mentioned, it was that, that when you finished the exploration or the building of the highway or the building of the bridge, you were dissolved. You'd done the public good that you came into being for. That's right. And, and that's what shifted when they got wealthy enough that they could then be in perpetuity. Our forefathers were very fearful of big corporations because they knew about the East India sure. Company. And they saw the power that they gained and, and, and how they served the king. And so when they handed us the, the, uh, the, the uh, Declaration of Independence, they say, we have delivered you a democracy if you can keep it. Right, right. Um, and I'm going to read a quote of yours. We are no longer truly a democracy as much as we are a corporatocracy, or in the classic terminology, a plutocracy. Um, in terms of corporate personhood and citizens united, the Supreme Court decision which opened up the floodgates for corporate funding, and now we see, since there wasn't a Disclosure Act passed at the same time, secret um, floodgates to secret unlimited corporate funds. What are you doing and what is a movement doing on those two grounds, corporate personhood and Citizens United? So uh, a couple of things. One is in my new role as the director of the Beyond Oil ca campaign at the Sierra Club, we're really going after oil and, and much like uh, companies or uh, groups went after tobacco in the past. And, and we're using oil now as a case study to say, look what this huge Corporate, these huge corporations and this industry is doing to corrupt your democracy. And our goal is really to say, the, this is how much money these oil companies are putting into your elected officials. This is how it's slanting the elections. This is how it's affecting other issues with, when these people get into power that you really care about. And in difficult times like this, oil companies are keeping their subsidies, but you're losing your health insurance. You're losing your jobs. You're losing your children's education uh, and the support for your ki kids' education. That's the trade-off that you get when corporations control. So that's the first thing. Let, let me ask you a question because, uh, and don't forget where you're going, but I've been saying for as long as I can think <laughs> that if all um, specific issue groups, environment, health, education, gender, you name it, um, banded together and went for public financing, that that would probably be the best thing they could do to further their their, their, their goals. But what often happens is people say the public doesn't get it because they say, why do I want to, I want to give tax money to politicians? I hate politicians. Are you doing a thing where, because it sounded like maybe you're going in that direction, where you say they invested X, they got Y. For a $1 million investment, they got a $1 billion payoff because as we know, the best investment any corporation can make is in a policy. Well, and you, you only have to look at oil to see the, the incredible return on investment that they get. They might put, they're the largest contributor to political uh, campaigns at the federal level, but you look at what they invest and you look at the $40 billion that they get back just in subsidies. Per year? Over the course of a decade. Over the course so of a decade. Billion so a year. $4 billion a year. $4 billion a year. But that is, that is yeah. a massive return on exactly. investment. And from a business point of view, it's just an investment. That's it's right. just a business decision. Yeah. So it's, and that's part of your education campaign. It's part of our education campaign. Because that's, I think, the key that people miss. It is. It's to say, I think one of the things we learned is that in the tobacco campaigns, it, when you looked at uh, the voting practices or people's preference for a candidate, the fav two candidates, they didn't really make a distinction on how they were voting on tobacco until the voters knew that this candidate was getting money from the tobacco industry. And then their preference shift, shifted 40 points. Ah. So we know that what makes people angry is when they think that their representatives are voting a corporate agenda because of the money that was put in their pocket. Well, wait until they see what oil companies are putting in, their, in, in the, the pocket well, of their representatives. In California, we had a good outcome recently where the oil companies uh, were the, of course, key funders of a couple of propositions, and the campaign against those propositions was simply, yes. this is Valero, this is, you Just know, our, and, yep. and, it, and it happened that the, that campaign was going on right as the BP oil spill was happening, yep. and and that, that, that proposition was, the oil companies very much outspent their opposition, but they lost. Yes, and it tells you a lot about the, uh, the public's attitudes towards oil companies. I think 
you know, w w there's a huge campaign right now, Sierra Club and other groups are involved in, in which is called Beyond Coal, which is shutting down all the coal-fired power plants and, and making sure no new ones come on board. But oil has got huge movement potential because no one really knows where their electricity comes from. People don't, re and they don't know what they pay for a kilowatt hour. That's what I was thinking, is that coal seems like, oh, that's something that happens in West Virginia. Yeah, but think but about- But LA gets most of its but, power from but coal. Exactly, look what we're doing on coal and people don't even know how bad right. these companies are, but they know how bad oil is. Right. And, and when we look at p opinion polls, Oil companies are just right above tobacco. Okay. When we're done with them, they'll be below them. I want to shift. You're moderating a panel, uh, Business is Unusual, New Models of Enterprise, Ownership, and Social Entrepreneurship. Tell us some of those new models, because it sounds like good news. So uh, it, there's a number of really interesting models. One is just looking at, for example, B Labs yes. and B Corp. So it's very exciting. B Corp went through and set up a number of process and performance standards. And they've asked small and medium-sized companies, and it could be large companies, but right now yeah. the, the cadre of, of early adopters are more middle-sized companies mm -hmm. and smaller. Uh, they've set up this certification standards that if you meet these certain standards, you can become a B Corporation. And let me just spe see if I'm correct on this. What that Currently, a corporation will say, I would love to do that but my fiduciary responsibility is to my shareholder. Yes. And basically what, what they will say is, bottom line legally, that's my only obligation. My employees, my community, my customers, you know, I, I, I'm, I'll, I'll do what I can. But that's, and with a B Corp, you actually are changing that equation. You are. You're basically saying and building and, and ultimately building it into your charter. And you're saying in this company, we attend to the social and environmental human rights responsibilities. And uh, we're, we're, our primary fiduciary responsibility is not to the shareholders, but it's to that, that panoply. It's not against the shareholders, it's but not they're just the one of many. But they're one of many. And so that's one of the really exciting things about it. Another ex model that came up is co-ops and how co-ops are growing. And the Mondragon uh, one in uh, Spain, for example, in Europe, uh, and talking about how these, and these are real industrial size These are successful. Very successful. Yeah. And it's really saying where workers will have much more power over the board of directors and who's elected, how the company is run, et cetera. It's not like they're interfering every day, but, but structurally their influence is built into the power of the corporation. Now, I, was Stephen Hill on your? He was. Your, okay. So, uh, Stephen Hill's book, Europe's Promise, and Tom Gagan's book, Were You Born in the Wrong Continent, both point out that in Germany, a corporation that has 2,000 employees, half of the board is elected by the workers. That's right. And that is my number one example for that there is a way to, to change capitalism that actually has a much bigger, a much bigger view. And, and that, you know, we're not talking about some nicey nice country. Germany's, depending on currency, it's either the number one or two exporting country in the world with a population of only 83 million. Yes. And, and there, corp if you have 2,000 employees, half the board's elected by the workers. So imagine if Walmart had to have 50% of its employee, of its board of directors elected by the employees. First of all, you know those employees would have, uh, for the, the company, would have good health insurance, not mediocre health insurance, right. if no health That's insurance. Right. You know that they would, would, their wages would be higher, and so they wouldn't be shifting all 80% of, of all the product, the production of all the products that they sell overseas. It would be a dramatic shift. You'd still have manufacturing in the United States. You That's would right. not have seen the decline in the unions that you've seen That's right. largely in other words, because think of Walmart. About how, how is Germany able to be a top exporting country? It's because they decided when China came on the scene, America decided we will shift all our manufacturing there, we'll do the finance. Germany said, we're good at manufacturing. We're gonna sell to China. We're not gonna compete with China. Right. No, I think if you, you look at the difference in terms of the ratio of CEO earnings to employees in the average, in, in, in Germany, I'm not sure what it was, but what it is, but it's, it's, it's pretty, it's not very great. I mean, it's like maybe one to something under a hundred, but in the that. United States, it's one to like 420. That's right. That's right. So the CEO is making 420 times what the average employee in the company is. 
our economic system, and this is one of the reasons I, you know, I'm concerned about it, because I don't think this is long term a very healthy model. <laughs> it is all designed to concentrate a huge amount of wealth in the hands of very few people, which is why the 400 top people, in, or richest people in the United States, have more wealth collectively than the bottom 120 million people yeah. in this country. And if people didn't hear that, 400 have more than 120 million, which leads us to something we don't have much time to talk about, but Occupy Wall Street. Occupy Wall Street is one of the most hopeful things that has come along in a long time. We got a grant a few years ago to design uh, a strategic corporate initiative. And we pulled together some of the best corporate thinkers in the country, some of the best corporate campaigners. We wrote a report called the Strategic Corporate Initiative. It's on our website. We identified the, what we thought were the most strategic paths. But the key to making it work was to build a citizen's movement, because it just wasn't going to happen. Change does not happen from inside the Beltway. It, it happens ha from outside. It doesn't happen from white papers. No. It doesn't <laughs> no even. No matter it, who's at the table. It, which is what our funder <laughs> reminded us when we delivered the report. But this is the first time that I've seen that there, there is a, a, a situation that has been brewing where there's now a focus of that anger. And one of the things I just saw this week, a poll, suggesting that more people, uh, a majority of people in the United States endorse Occupy Wall Street. Many more endorse it than endorse the Tea Party at this point, or endorse the Tea Party at the same point in its, in its inception. And probably more than endorse either of our major political exactly. parties. Exactly. We well, know. our major political parties They're are They're both under unpopular. 50%. But yes, that we finally, and I think the brilliant thing they did, although they've been faulted so far, uh, we're talking now in mid-October about not having clear enough message and so on, but the adoption of we are the 99%, you know if you're, you know if you're in the 1%, and you know if you're in the 99. <laughs> it's brilliant. You know, it, that, that's one of those frames yeah. that changes Boom. the debate. Exactly. And I dare the opposition to, to come up and argue otherwise. I'm going to ask you one last question, which is that if the link uh, that makes someone a bioneer or says, yeah, yeah, I, I'll fit under that umbrella, is that you learn from natural systems and attempt as best we can to live as part of nature, how does that apply to the work you're doing? Well, I think our work is really about transforming business. Fundamentally, it's about transforming business and transforming government. And so if you believe that sy systems really are functionally about nature, then you believe that we ought to have a diversity, not just in ecology, but a diversity in business. And you know that we, while we need big species, we don't need huge species. We don't need T-Rex. <laughs> exactly. We need a diversity in terms of size as well. And you know that also that just as there are the predators, there are also uh, there are those that prey on the predators or keep them in check. And, and, and sometimes that's a collective thing. So it may well be that you need, and it, it absolutely is the case, you need a strong NGO community that keeps uh, collectively, it keeps some of these big corporations in check. One other thing I'll even add to what you're saying is that we, we know now that what allowed humans to succeed, small, frail, slow as they are, was social cohesion. Yes. That as much as people want to tell us that we are competitive by nature, we survive to this day because of our ability for social cohesion. And just as in nature, an ecosystem is what survives, not an individual organism competing with the others that basically I think the kind of shifts you're do going is saying let's view ourselves as a wide ecosystem. I, I am and in fact I think that that's the ultimate morality you know because it, morality really evolved as a function of people coming together in a community to protect themselves and to grow and to grow themselves and to sustain themselves and so they developed principles that guide them which became basically those fundamental moral principles and I think in some ways, so although I'm not religious, I do believe we're fundamentally in the business of making our society more ecologically sustainable and as a result, more moral. Very good. Thanks a lot, Michael. My pleasure. Thank you.